Howdy, everybody. Get my tea. So for me, this is my second week of being stuck at home, more or less. I've been able to go out a couple times. But I do want to talk about some upcoming calculations I'm going to be doing. Excuse me. Um, with regards to COVID-19, which is the disease, that is when you have it as a human being versus the virus, um, which I think is officially called SARS-CoV-Coronavirus-2 uh, or something like that, um, that it is related to the older SARS. Uh, anyway, one of the things that I had told people I would try to do is to estimate total number of deaths, maybe in the world, maybe in the United States alone, from coronavirus, and I'm running into trouble. I want to explain that trouble uh, before I can make some estimations uh, and talk a little bit about actuarial standards of practice. I bet you weren't expecting that, other than I put it in the, t in the title. Um, so there's the actuarial standards of practice. Uh, this is just for the United States, but within every country that has formal actuarial groups, uh, they have something like that. So um, there is uh, you know, something like that in Canada, in the UK, in various countries in Europe, you know, it, it's all over the world. Uh, the UK and the US, I would say, have the most developed set of standards of practice. We get into a lot of detail and some of it can be obscure, but we also have some very broad based ones. And so, here on this page, I'm showing the general ones that basically apply to all lines of business, whether it's pension or property and casualty or life or health insurance, actuaries, whatever you work on. And this is, I would say, my second favorite actuarial standard of practice, ASAP 23. And we all know them by a number, don't we, guys? Everybody who has had to use them uh, does know them. So ASAP 23 is on data quality. And I'm going to show you uh, it here. It always comes with a transmittal memo. Um, but then, and I have to take my glasses off for this, then you get a purpose, scope, and notice these double lines. Every thing, single thing that is a double line has an official definition. And if you think it is a bit too persnickety to define data, let me tell you what there are consequences to not following these ASOPs. Um, it gets brought up in actual, actuarial malpractice lawsuits, but also you can be expelled from the various actuarial organizations you're a member of, lose your credentials, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it behooves one to know all of the major ASOPs that cover your work, and data quality covers basically all of us. Now, to be sure, I'm not really doing actuarial work per se, in these YouTube videos that said, I want to, I don't want to do what I am seeing a lot of people doing. So what is the value of me trying to do an analysis versus all the other statistical analyses that I've been seeing out there? Is do I have a special area of expertise that I can bring to this? And yes, I do have uh, the area of expertise in terms of mortality trends, which I know very well uh, from my own personal research interest, and I'm just, I'm just into it, but it also impinges upon my daily work. Uh, that said, I do have to say there will be things I don't talk about because I do it for my paid work, and I am not going to undercut my paid work, which is research that we publish for money, okay? So that said, uh, just overall deaths when, and where I'm not doing really any special analysis or I'm explaining someone else's analysis, um, you know, that's not a big deal. Anyway, let's go back to this data quality uh, issue, okay? And uh, things that we have to take into consideration when we're doing an analysis is that we have appropriate data. Um, and so you can see, here's the definition of data here, and th this is all the cross-reference. You'll see if I hover over this, this is the exact same definition as you see below. Um, and this is pretty consistent between ASOPs, by the way. Um, they have a committee that tried to make sure the language used in all of the ASOPs were 
you know, similar, um, that they were consistent. We are really big on consistency and accuracy, though not necessarily precision. There can be, you know, big error bars around our estimates, um, even though we often have to give a single number for financial reporting because, you know, tax auditors really don't like when you give um, a range of possibilities um, as opposed to we need a single number that's on your balance sheet or income statement or whatever. Okay, so here we go. Um, so I, I will read some of this out. Appropriate data that are accurate and complete may not be avail available. That's definitely true with regards to the novel coronavirus. The actuary should use available data that in the actuary's professional judgment allow the actuary to perform the desired analysis. And this is where I'm going to stop. Um, a lot of the data that have been bandied about, so for example, Johns Hopkins has had um, a data set that they are aggregating data from multiple sources. I have a problem with this. Uh, let's just ignore the issue with regards to how much one can even trust uh, China's data. And China is not the only country in question here, by the way, of why I can't do it using the complete data set. Now, there are some things I could say, oh, things balance out. But no, it doesn't, um, especially with something this new and something so sensitive. There is no way in heck I am going to take data that was collected in lots of different situations using lots of different definitions for official cases. That's not uniform across countries or in sometimes not even within a country uh, in terms of what their testing regimes are. I mean, within the United States itself, New York State, I believe, has the most extensive testing for coronavirus. Um, and even though Washington State had had um, the most cases before, um, it's still uncertain. And, and you can see there is a lot of uncertainty. And uncertainty is okay. But the problem is I do need to know kind of the qualities of the data in order to make uh, projections. Now, I could use mo models, and I'll just go back to my standards of practice. There is a new ASOP. That was that's only effective in October 1st. Oh no! Uh, but there's nothing stopping me from using it now. Um, it's a completely new ASOP and it's on modeling. And so I could use pandemic models to try to project number of cases and uh, number of deaths. And many people are, and the Society of Actuaries has um, some models that you can play around with and some research that was done mm, like back in 2006 or something. Uh, but the basic uh, structure of the model is the same. It's what parameters you put into the model that will give you um, a variety of results. In any case, let's go back to data quality. Uh, the issue is that um, I did find a set of data that I find somewhat reliable, and that's South Korea. And I will do analysis of the South Korean data, or explain, I should say, what you're seeing in the South Korean data. Because other people have actually done the analysis in South Korea itself, has provided pretty much all you need to know, and I don't even need to do extra steps. So, yay, South Korea. Um, that said, all of this, the uh, uncertainty and the unreliability even in terms of the number of deaths from a particular disease. And you would think, and I will tell you, um, <laughs> it's hard to hide dead bodies. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't have personal uh, experience, okay? Anyway, um, this goes back, and this is known back, to 1665. Now, Daniel Defoe wrote his book, uh, uh, Journal of the Plague Year, and the whole Title, of course, is a journal of the plague year being observations or memorials of the most remarkable occurrences and well, as well public as private, what ha happened in London during the last great visitation in 1665, written by a citizen who continued all the while in London, never made public before. Okay. Um, yes, it's called a historical novel, but I want to point something out to you. Uh, novel is often compared to the actual contemporary accounts of the plague in the diary of Samuel Pepys. Defoe's account, which appears to include much research, and it does, uh, appears, it does include much research based on official statistics recorded in 1665, is a far more systematic and detailed than uh, Pepys' first-person account. Um, 
Defoe himself was a little kid when this plague broke out, and it's not even clear to me that he was in London at the time, but it sounds like his uncle was, and a lot of the personal stories come from his uncle. And what's great about this, it reminds me of Herodotus, in that Herodotus's uh, histories, uh, he relate stories and he's he tells you who told him the stories like i heard from an egyptian when i visited egypt they told me this story about libya and blah 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 um and so then you get the story sometimes herodotus tells you that he doesn't believe the story and you get the same thing in this book that there are a few kind of uh extraordinary stories that are hard to believe and the author himself says I don't really believe it. And that could be Defoe or that could be Defoe's uncle saying this. But he said these were the rumors that were going around at the time or these were the stories that were being told at the time. Um, so I consider this more of a third person, you know, uh, this, is, this is more like Herodotus's histories than a novel. And I would not call Herodotus a novel either. Um, yes, there are bits that are of questionable truthiness, but that's true of a lot of nonfiction and historic histories, serious historical books, nonfiction. I consider this a nonfiction book. I don't care. Um, yes, it's got a narrative in it and this, that, and the other, um, but let's not get hung up on genre. Here's an important part of the book, and this is at Project Gutenberg. It's obviously in the public domain. One of the issues that Defoe points out, and you'll see these numbers here, I'll put it in the middle. These are from the bills of mortality. And that is every parish within London, actually every parish in, in England, and it was Church of England at this time, remember, uh, would keep a record of births and deaths. And it made sense uh, long before there were birth certificates and this, that, and the other. And this was the, the benefit of having a single official church is that you'd have all the births and deaths recorded within your local parish. Um, so they would record you down and people didn't move around as much back then. Okay. So each parish had their bills of mortality, which were published weekly. And in 1665, of course, they had print. Um, so they would print these and these would be recorded. Uh, these bills of mortality and their numbers are throughout the book. Um, I will actually want to go back and study these myself and I am sure there are people who have done academic projects on this. In any case, Defoe points out there were incentives not for the officials unlike today but for individuals and their families and friends to misclassify plague deaths as deaths due to something else. And he points out there was a suspicious increase in the number of deaths for other things. Um, so here's an example um, where dead of diseases beside the plague, 18th July to July 25th. So you can see these are week by week, uh, 942. Then it went up to 1,000, 1,200, 1,439, August 8th to 15th. Even back then, uh, death did not increase that much in the summer. Uh, nowadays, in the United States and many northern hemisphere temperate zone countries, you get your greatest number of deaths in December and January um, from flu, pneumonia, all of that jazz when it's cold when you get a peak in august yeah that was probably the plague um so he is making the argument using the concept of what's called excess mortality and so we talk about this a lot um, in actual work with regards to pandemic epidemic and then other adverse mortality trends so for example we have been getting excess mortality from the opioid crisis in the United States, and it has been appearing elsewhere, but definitely in the United States, we've had um, an uptick in mortality specifically from opioids. Um, so that's something to note. So excess mortality is a giveaway. Something is going on. So what I will say 
And unfortunately, I'm not going to have the data right now that would be live right now to be able to look at excess mortality. Um, but it seems to me there are a lot of misclassified deaths. With regards to China, there may be deaths that aren't even counted yet. And there have been arguments of why certain dead people, you die alone, nobody goes checks because everyone's on lockdown. You will find the body a month later, perhaps, when it gets to be height of summer and it starts to stink, maybe. Anyway, um, versus Italy, and my understanding is that in Italy, if you tested positive coronavirus and then died, it doesn't matter what you actually died from, it counts as a coronavirus death. Uh, given that their median age at death in Italy for coronavirus specifically is like 79.5, um, a lot of those people are probably dying of something else in addition to people actually dying from coronavirus. So um, I can't use Italy's numbers and people are using Italy's numbers to freak everybody out. Um, Here's, here's something else you need to know about Italy, and I will find the link for this um, for my Substack post later. Italy has worse flu experience than many other countries, definitely worse than the U.S. Um, evidently, Italy just has some bad infectious disease results before this pandemic. Could be the healthcare center system could be that they kiss everybody and they're not particularly hygienic. Um, you know, hugging and kissing everybody. Yeah, you're going to spread disease a lot. Um, and I don't know about their vaccination rates with regards to the flu. Uh, then there are other issues with regards to their health care system. Okay, so that's the state of play. I will be looking at numbers and talking about numbers in uh, future videos and posts on Substack. Yes, again, I'm just going to keep saying this until stump. My original site is back, and I'm sorry that may take months. This is not a priority for us to fix right now, and I don't have, um, I'm not going to fix it myself. Uh, Stuart's looking into it. Um, I'll be doing it on the Substack, uh, marypatcampbell.substack.com. It's free. You can sign up for email updates, and yeah, it'll probably ask you to try um, to get you to um, do a paid subscription. You do not have to do that, but obviously Substack gets a cut um, if you do pay. Uh, don't worry about paying for anything. Just pick the free. You'll get everything. The only thing the paid people can do um, is that they can leave comments if they want to. Uh, if they don't want to, that's just fine. And you can always comment for free on YouTube. So see y'all later.